should get started because uh, we have a fairly fixed amount of time in this room. Um, I'm talking while I'm uh, at the Asia Research Institute and I'm in charge of the Cultural Studies in Asia Research Cluster. Uh, so, welcome. Let me just take a few minutes for those of you who do not know about the Asia Research Institute to introduce the Institute before we get started. The Asia Research Institute is in the National University of Singapore. Um, it is a in the current context of global shrinking of academic funding, a fairly privileged place of having people, of, for those of us who only need to do research and do not have to teach, uh, which is getting more and more often, uh, very rare these days. And we, have, we are a strictly research institution uh, with researchers from all over the world and uh, in fact very few Singaporeans other than people who have to manage the place. And, uh, there are different levels of fellowships from new PhDs in postdoctoral programs to very senior scholars who come to Singapore to do some writing over a three month period. There are six research focus in the Asia Research Institute. Um, among them are Asian cities or Asian urbanism, religion and globalization, changing family structure, migration, cultural studies, science, technology, and society. And just in case those programs, those clusters just in case there are some really interesting individuals who doesn't fall into any of those areas, we will get them in, in what is called the open cluster. At any one time at the institute, there would be about 35 to 50 research fellows. It's very hard. People come and go very quickly, so it's very difficult to fix the numbers but approximately that's the best it is. Uh, we are an extremely event intensive place. The events team that is mending the table or womaning the table uh, and getting things organized all the time including Henry who is indispensable otherwise the technology will always be in trouble. They are extremely busy because we have somewhere around 12 to 15 workshops and conferences a year. So that means every month we run at least one international workshop or international conference, often two. Uh, so it keeps them extremely busy. The current Asia, the Asia Trend series um, is one of our public outreach program. We run this as a, uh, that's why it is held in conjunction here with the National Life Report uh, as a public event. This is the fourth of, the, of this series. Uh, each one of the clusters organize one of the evenings. And uh, tonight, the cluster responsible for this evening is uh, the Cultural Studies in Asia group. Before I introduce the speaker, uh, I want to make one announcement that for those of you who are interested in cinemas, this Saturday, in this very location, there will be a workshop on Singapore cinemas, the location of film exhibition. In this particular case, it is really about the theaters and not about film. Right. Uh, it's, it's organized by the Ari Cultural Studies Cluster and the Singapore <laughs> National Heritage Society at, uh, from 10 o'clock to 4 o'clock. Okay.
Okay, uh, for this evening, we are really privileged to have Mr. David Banjuski to uh, be to provide the main speaker for tonight, for main speech for tonight on uh, media and culture in China's current era of transition. David is a research fellow at the uh, Journalism Institute at Hong Kong University. He speaks uh, both Japanese and Mandarin, having learned the language since he was in primary school. Uh, and he's been, he had actually worked as a journalist before, before he became not quite an academic. Uh, even though he's doing all the academic, all the research work that a normal academic would do, but uh, he hasn't quite decided whether he was going to ever do a PhD. <laughs> Although, uh, that for the amount of research and knowledge that he already has, and I was talking this afternoon, that he might as well sit down and write the dissertation and just submit it. <laughs> Okay, so for this evening, uh, Mr. David Bantus. Speaking after David is uh, Dr. Tanya Lin, who is one of NUS old graduate. Uh, she did a BA and an MA in sociology with us, and then subsequently did a PhD at the Queensland University of Technology in media and communication studies. She's currently working for MDA, but for tonight she will be speaking in her own capacity. Without much ado, David, please. David will speak for about 40 minutes, uh, followed by Mike. Well, uh, first of all, I want to thank Professor Chua and uh, Valerie Go uh, from the Department of Sociology for uh, organizing this talk. Uh, and this is my first time in Singapore, so I'm happy to meet uh, so many of you. Uh, just, I'm going to go back to Hong Kong and the China Media Project and tell them that 100, maybe 100 plus people came to listen to a talk on Chinese media. I'm not sure they'll believe me. Um, but uh, obviously, uh, Chinese media and culture are very complex issues. They're difficult to cover in, in 40 minutes. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I want to begin with a question that prompted my invitation to come and speak to you tonight. Uh, what is the state of the media industry uh, in China today uh, with a set of more, I, I think, fundamental questions? Uh, what is China's voice? Who is China's voice? And how is China's voice, or how are China's voices uh, changing in China today? Uh, let me get my PowerPoint going. So you'll notice my talk is called Voices in the Gap, uh, Media and Culture in China's Age of uh, Transition. Um, the question of voice, I would suggest to you, is ultimately what the media and culture are all about. Um, so I want to center on this idea of uh, voices and all the other issues, uh, the commercialization, new technology, the dollars and cents of media as an industry, uh, censorship politics, etc. Uh, these are issues orbiting around this more fundamental uh, idea. Um, this will also, I think, help to frame uh, these issues uh, of media and culture in a larger global uh, context. Specifically, how do they impact China's role and image uh, in the world? Um, all of us know that China is now the, the, the cause of, of much excitement in the world, uh, but also some anxiety. Uh, you know, China is, is a global economic power, of course. Uh, it's a nation of undeniable importance. Uh, but what kind of nation is uh, China? Uh, in a very real sense, I think uh, the fear, uh, uh, and there is some fear uh, uh, about what China might be or become, arises from uh, China's inability to explain itself. Uh, and China's policies and attitude toward the media and toward culture, toward intellectual life, are fundamentally uh, at issue uh, on this question. Uh, for the past 
three decades, uh, China, to borrow a phrase from uh, one of our fellows at Hong Kong U and, and a Shanghai historian, uh, Zhu Xueqin, uh, China has shut its mouth and run uh, for riches. This is a quote from uh, Zhu Xueqin, another quote from Zhu Xueqin here. Um, and Zhu talks about the capacity to explain oneself. And this, of course, is what culture, I think, ultimately is about, about the making and shaping and articulating of oneself and, and one's relationship to uh, society. Um, but further on in this, in this passage, uh, which comes from a book published uh, by our center, uh, Jew describes China as a kind of uh, monster, uh, responding to this idea of a China threat. Uh, and and he, he says, quote, the world is watching this silent economic giant as it lurches forward, not making a sound, its two eyes fixed ahead, on occasion letting out a roar that no one uh, can understand. And, he, and he, he says, who would not be afraid? So I'm, I'm suggesting here that what frightens and threatens many people in, in the world is not that China's voice is becoming louder. Um, that's necessary, I think, and inevitable. Uh, it's that for all intents and purposes, uh, China is still silent. And that makes it a difficult place uh, to understand. Um, so <clears throat> China may speak, but only with one sort of accepted legitimate uh, voice, and that voice is bought at the price of, of repression and silence too, which greatly undermines its, its credibility. And finally, we have voices like you see on the left there. Um, this is during protesting international prejudice over the torch relay uh, for the Beijing uh, Olympics in 2008, and these voices sort of emerge as, as shouts and screams, and uh, they're rather like Zhu Xuechi's roars that no one can understand. So, but I want to set aside this idea uh, for the moment, which is, broadly speaking, is about uh, soft power, what, what Joseph and I called uh, the power of attraction as opposed to the power of coercion, and look at China's media climate, uh, and the, the, culture, the, the climate for culture and media over the last 30 years and how, how it's developed. Um, first of all, anyone who spends time looking at China, watching China's media and culture, understands that control or the restriction of the voice uh, is not at all a full picture of what's happening uh, in China. Uh, and we often assume that, uh, that, that China is a place where no expression occurs outside of a narrow Communist Party uh, agenda. And some of you might think that's the kind of place I was just describing. It's not, and, and uh, I'll, I'll come back to that. But we hear constantly, uh, it seems, in our own press about the shutdown of that publication or the banning of, of, this, uh, of a film or the removal of an editor at a, at a, main street, at a, at a newspaper. And we, we measure, we tend to measure uh, the speech in contemporary China by these flashes of violence against speech rather than by the, the um, uh, examples, sometimes brilliant examples, that we do find uh, in China, uh, voices like uh, these. Uh, this is a shameless self-promotion. This is my new book on investigative reporting uh, in China. Uh, you can buy it on Amazon right now. Um, but for many of us, I think the very idea of investigative reporting in China seems an impossibility. Uh, when, when I started this book, uh, one of my old journalism professors joked. He said, well, that's a great project, a book on investigative reporting. What are you working on next week? Uh, you thought it would be a very short uh, project. Um, so voices like, like these are in our, in our book. Zhao uh, Shilong, a government-run hospital selling female uh, patients into prostitution, uh, reported by Zhao Shilong. Uh, the acceptance of bribes by Xinhua news agency reporters uh, covering the story of a mine disaster, uh, reported by the uh, Ocham. And then the vicious exploitation of taxi drivers uh, by companies with ties to the Beijing uh, government, uh, reported by Wang Keqin, who incident incidentally reported the recent uh, vaccine uh, scandal in China as well. Um, so we hear all the time about control, uh, but control can't possibly explain why we see reports like these emerge from China's media environment uh, as well. So I want to back up and talk about these voices in the gap, as I'm calling them. 
and about what are some of the key dynamics in China uh, defining the development of China's media sector uh, today. And much of what I'll show you is about news media, uh, but uh, these can apply to other areas as well, such as films, and I'll talk a little bit about independent uh, films as well. Um, but from 1949 up to the start of economic reforms in, in 1978, the relationship between the state, the party, uh, and uh, society in China, uh, or, or media and society in China, was defined in a very limited uh, way. Uh, media were the mouthpieces of the party, and the voice of the party was the voice of the people. Uh, so media in the, 19, the early 1980s looked rather like this. We have party newspapers in the upper left hand corner there, and broadcasters financed and controlled by the state with no commercial uh, operations, no media market. Uh, all are tightly controlled and conveying limited ideological uh, messages. Uh, with the 1980s, there was a sh uh, some shift in the attitude of the press in China, mostly as a backlash against the falsehood and emptiness, as it was called, of, of uh, newspapers during the Cultural Revolution. And thanks to the climate of reforms, uh, there was a newfound sense of professionalism, too, among, among Chinese uh, journalists in the 1980s. Um, by the late 1980s, economic reforms had brought new prosperity, uh, but also new social problems, and uh, also problems like deepening uh, corruption. And one way to address these issues was to um, empower the media to take on a slightly different uh, role, reflecting issues of more of concern to the, the people. In 1987, uh, Premier Zhao Ziyang mentioned watchdog journalism, or in Chinese, supervision by public opinion, uh, for the first time in an official uh, capacity. Um, and this was in the political report to the full session of the, the party congress that year. And it was the first explicit sanction uh, we have of, it, of investigative reporting or watchdog journalism in China. And it was key to the investigative reporting that would come uh, a decade uh, later. But the media were essentially empowered to supervise power in the public interest without prior sanction uh, of the party. And, but this was a, a what's, it's been called a liberal conception of watchdog journalism. And it was uh, short-lived. Uh, I think you can all guess what happened next. Um, in April 1989, uh, massive student demonstrations broke out uh, following the, the death on April 15th of, of former Communist Party chief Hu Yaobang. Uh, by early May, uh, the, the demonstrations were still going strong, but uh, Premier Zhao Ziyang took a light-handed approach uh, to handling them. In fact, on, on May 6th, he met with his top uh, propaganda ministers, and he said, open things up a bit. No harm uh, can come of that. And that meeting is key to understanding uh, media control in China, even, even today. Uh, enter uh, guidance of public opinion. Uh, when, when Jiang Zemin reclaimed order, he criticized Zhao Ziyang for his mishandling of the unrest that spring. And he said that Zhao Ziyang's open uh, media policy had encouraged quote, support for the student movement, and had wrongly guided matters in the direction of uh, chaos. So we have this idea that failure to properly control or, or, and guide the media leads to social and political chaos, and it still underpins uh, press uh, controls uh, in, in China today, and cultural controls. Um, so the idea is that by controlling the media and uh, the party controls public opinion and solidifies party rule, and it also prevents embarrassments and inconveniences for the party, uh, like this one. <laughs> and as you can see, this is irreverent uh, CNN coverage on, on Taiwanese television. Uh, but the, the propaganda department still issues directives um, on a daily basis to media, and they, they enforce this guidance of public opinion on a, on a daily basis, this, this concept that, that John placed at the core of, of press control. Uh, just a quick idea of what propaganda discipline is all about uh, in, in China. But so basically the 1990s began uh, as a period of intensified uh, media control. Uh, that's my, my basic point here. Um, but Deng Xiaoping's southern tour in 1992 accelerated economic reforms uh, once again. And the rapid economic growth and the social change that came with it uh, created a really interesting environment, and in some ways a very promising environment for uh, the development of media in the 1990s. Um, at the China Media Project, we 
use a formula called the three C's. I'll just put them all up here, by the way, uh, to talk about this complicated uh, situation. Uh, we've just been through control of the notion of, of guidance, uh, but there were other forces at work in the 1990s. <clears throat> uh, commercialization of the media was the big one. Uh, and by the mid-1990s, uh, subsidies were progressively pulled from government-supported uh, media in China, non-essential government-run media, and we also saw new commercial media ventures uh, taking off in China. Um, there were a number of reasons for this. Uh, I won't, uh, I'm afraid we'll run out of time here, so I want to move through these. But first there was uh, the idea that well, support for publications was expensive, so, so this was a, a budgetary relief. Um, and also publications, there were so many government-run publications that were non-essential, but the, the idea was that they were detracting from uh, key publications like People's Daily, and they were sort of noise. Um, and then there was the idea that the media sector could become a vital part of the of overall economic growth, so uh, they promoted commercialization. And also fear, um, China was trying to, to join the WTO at the time, and it was integrated with the world economy, so there was this fear of the coming of the wolves, it's called, that, that, that foreign media companies, News Corp, etc., would enter China and there would be no way for them to compete because they weren't prepared uh, for competition. So in the 90s, the term media industry was actually on the rise. I didn't put a graph in here to, to show you uh, the rise of the term. But we had a, a media market in China for the first time. We started to see the launch of commercial newspapers. These are spin-offs of the major party uh, uh, dailies. And uh, these commercial spin-offs of party newspapers were very different sorts of animals from their, what are called the, the uh, parent papers. Uh, the, the commercial papers are actually called child papers in China, or zibo. Um, but they had to survive in a competitive uh, commercial media environment. Uh, they had to deliver readers, uh, advertisers, or readers to advertisers. So we have the rise of the media consumer in China in the 1990s. And another important change was a growing sense, again, of professionalism among uh, journalists and media practitioners, a sense that they were working not necessarily just for the party interest, but for the public, for the public interest. Um, so media control was never, formally speaking, loosened uh, in any sense, but the effect of this rise of the reader and commercialization uh, was in some ways electric. Uh, so it's at this point, too, that we have the emergence of investigative reporting in, in China, uh, which I mentioned earlier, and uh, a lot of it began as state-sanctioned investigative reporting. Uh, and it's important to, to note, too, that this mandate of, of what I call Yulin Jindu, the watchdog journalism, has been mentioned in every political report since 1987. So it continues to serve as a kind of mandate. But uh, commercial newspapers were taking this mandate in a very different uh, direction. So uh, if you, again, our book has a lot of cases uh, from up to about 2003 uh, of investigative reporting uh, in China. So the upshot was that in spite of uh, strict media control in a formal sense, um, there was an atmosphere of chaos, our third, if you remember, our three C's there. Um, and this could be exploited by the media and by journalists, uh, whether their goals were primarily professional or uh, commercial. So uh, this animation is a little slow on here. Um, so this is what media looked like uh, today along the axis of control to free and plan uh, to market. At the bottom left we have uh, fierce market competition. It's going to come up in a minute under the, just to the right of the control uh, uh, press that's worth. Um, and these are publications that don't really push the bounds of control but they seek to compete uh, commercially. And we have media further along the free press axis. This is, you can think of this as professionalism, really not, not freedom. Um, and they would include the likes of uh, Southern Metropolis Daily and Guangzhou, uh, Taijing Magazine, Southern Weekend, and they're going to appear on the right. Uh, and <clears throat> it's in this cloud of activity. Uh, this should come up soon. This is way too slow. Um, but you'll see in a moment, I've labeled it Struggle for Press Freedom. And this is where we see the most interesting investigative work uh, and hard news happening. And essentially, it's the clever use of what, this, what I've called chaos to spike uh, control. 
Um, but by the time Hu Jintao came to power in late 2002, the media landscape in China had dramatically uh, changed. So think of the three C's I've described. And now we also have, like this one, um, an immense coverage gap uh, emerging. We have party newspapers in which we tend to see a focus on leaders and their actions, and commercial newspapers where we see more human interest coverage, a greater diversity of sourcing for stories, uh, and more story variety, and more relevance of, of stories for uh, the general readership. Uh, as an example, for fun here, I have a number of party newspapers, and this is on the opening day of, of the National People's Congress this year, and I uh, challenge you to find differences among these three uh, party newspapers. And here we have uh, Shaoxiang Morning Post, and this is a commercial newspaper in Hunan province, uh, taking one small portion of, of Wen Jiabao's uh, government work report for the NPC uh, on political reform. It's just one section, of course, of that report. And they lead with that, uh, with that uh, part of the report, and they push. So they're pushing in a different direction with their coverage. And uh, this is why we're seeing circulations of party media dropping through the floor, and why uh, there are massive uh, growing circulations for uh, commercial uh, newspapers in China. So guidance is sort of, this traditional notion of guidance has kind of reached a point of, of crisis. The possibilities of chaos are dif difficult to predict and uh, to handle. Um, you can imagine the, the culmination, in a way, of this crisis happening, um, being, one of the, being one of the first things to happen on Hu Jintao's watch. Uh, in 2003, we had uh, the outbreak of, of SARS, uh, which uh, tested information controls in China. And then we had uh, this story uh, of Swindrigong. Uh, and this was reported by Guangzhou's Southern Metropolis Daily. Uh, and they investigated the death of this young migrant who's a college graduate. And he was severely beaten in detention uh, in, in Guangzhou. And this really shook China quite deeply that spring. And it, it eventually brought the repeal of China's law on detention and repatriation of, of migrants in the cities. Um, another key factor in the Switzerland case was the internet, and I don't have time to get into that, uh, unfortunately. But ultimately, this media spring of 2003, as some, some called it, uh, came to an abrupt end in that, that following June. And a lot of these newspapers who reported quite aggressively on this, these and other stories were uh, disciplined. Um, so we have, so what now? Uh, well, in the years since 2003 to today, we've had a shift uh, once again in the nature of uh, control in China. Uh, news controls have responded to all of these changes uh, through the 90s that I've just described. Um, but of course, you have to remember that the changing uh, controls say as much about the dynamism of China's new uh, media environment as they do about the leadership's determination uh, to, to control, to, to maintain their grip on the media. So always keep in mind these three C's, control, change, and uh, chaos. Uh, but before I discuss this next phase of uh, control, I want to tell you a different but parallel story um, about other uh, voices in the gap. So I want to rewind a bit and talk about the emergence and development of independent film uh, in China. And this too is a legacy of the 1990s and uh, an era of increased control, um, at least formally speaking, but a lot of interesting uh, change. Um, it wasn't until the mid-1990s, that the, around 1996, that we had the term independent film actually appearing, being used more widely in China. Um, this is a picture of my own uh, partner in crime, uh, Zhao Daiyong, the director of uh, Ghost Town, a uh, critically acclaimed uh, documentary film, and The High Life, uh, which we just showed in, in Hong Kong last month. Uh, here he is accepting the Presti Prize and International Critics Award for The High Life. At Hong Kong International Film Festival. Uh, I'll let you absorb this quote uh, from, from Chao Dayong uh, as I talk about the history a little bit of, of independent film. Um, anyhow, it was in the 90s that the, the term came into to wider use in China. And we tend to think of independent film or indies as film produced without initial uh, financing or distribution from a major uh, film studio. Uh, but in China, independent, of course, also means that these films are unapproved uh, or illegal. Uh, and because all films in China have to be pre-approved, uh, 
before they enter production by the State Administration of Radio, Film, and Television Ministry under the uh, State Council. Uh, like mainstream news media, uh, films are subject to, to control, uh, so scripts are pre-approved for, for production. Um, if you don't go through these official approval channels, then the domestic film market in China is effectively uh, closed to you. Uh, but once again, uh, just as in the area of news media, uh, we had broader changes in China that, that enabled the emergence of these alternative voices or, or voices in the gap, uh, despite the persistence of uh, controls. Uh, for films, one of the biggest changes has been technological. Uh, in the 90s, of course, digital video technology um, became the widely available in China as well, and the cost progressively lower. Um, so we also had computer-based editing softwares, uh, like eventually Final Cut Pro in 1999. Um, so we've had a revolution in digital uh, filmmaking uh, technology, and more, ever more professional tools available to amateur uh, filmmakers. Um, as technologies lowered the threshold for entry into filmmaking, we began seeing a wide range of films, uh, especially uh, documentaries from people with a broad range of, of backgrounds in China. Um, and I'll give you a taste of some of the, the people. Uh, this is uh, Hu Jian. He was born in, in 1958, uh, graduated with a degree in oil painting from the People's Liberation Army Arts College. And he worked as a, a reporter for a number of years for Xinhua News Agency uh, before quitting to pursue the story of uh, Lin Zhao. And this was a young woman jailed during the Cultural Revolution for speaking out against uh, and criticizing Mao Zedong. She called uh, for an end to despotism in China. And she was executed in uh, 1968. And uh, uh, whose film, uh, Searching for Li Zhao's Soul, uh, is an unflinching look at the ridiculous and cruel aspects of the, of the Cultural Revolution. Uh, but of course, the film can't be seen in China, at least without great risk. In fact, uh, I, I met Hu a couple years back, and he said that a teacher in, in northern China who had screened the film for her students at an art college uh, was sentenced to uh, one year of education, re-education through labor uh, for, for screening it. Uh, but let's move on to more recent events. Uh, today, as you know, is the two-year anniversary of the, the 2008 Sutran earthquake. Um, and this is a still from uh, 1428, a film by independent director uh, Du Haibin about the earthquake. And that's uh, Du Inset there. He's receiving the Orizonte Prize for Best Documentary at Venice Film Festival. Um, and it's a, a, a much more complex look at the, at the sadness and loss and grief and corruption uh, um, in, in 2008. And I like this quote from him. It sort of shows you the contrast between a film like this, the picture it shows you, and the, the, the mainstream picture you tend to get from media like China Central uh, Television. Um, but Chinese media did report the uh, 2008 earthquake with some courage, especially in the first week to 10 days uh, after the quake. And they even started covering sent more sensitive issues like the collapse of, of uh, schools in Sutran. Um, but this initial openness um, was quickly scrapped. And by June, an order had come down from the propaganda department against reporting on schools and against, look, against looking back on the uh, issues of responsibility uh, in the earthquake. Um, and it was once again these voices in the gap uh, that we saw pursuing uh, the, these deeper stories. In this case, we have uh, Southern Weekend, a uh, newspaper in Guangzhou. Um, they were exploring issues of responsibility. Uh, this is about the school's issue. And quickly, here, here's a rundown of the problems that they had with these stories. Openness could be allowed for the initial coverage of, of the circumstances surrounding the disaster and the relief effort, um, but the deeper issues of why and then responsibility issues, those had to be uh, left alone. <coughs> As I said, the documentary filmmakers were, independent filmmakers were in Sichuan to record the deeper dimensions of, and stories of the quake. Uh, I mentioned 1428. Uh, this is Ai Xiaomei, uh, a professor at Guangzhou Sun Yat-sen University. She's a well-known feminist uh, scholar. And in 2004, she set up an independent documentary uh, center, uh, a, a film studio, 
to help draw attention to issues facing uh, marginalized groups. And she's an example, again, of the diversity of backgrounds we see in independent film. She's, of course, a scholar, but we see journalists, students, designers, people from all different backgrounds. And she refers to her filmmaking as activist uh, documentary. Um, this is Aisha Mae's latest documentary film, Our Children, uh, Woman, the Wawa. Uh, the film looks at the issue of collapsed schools in Sichuan through the eyes of the, of the parents whose children were killed in the quake. And we hear from them directly in the film. There's no mediating sort of omniscient voice that, as again, you hear on China Central Television. Um, and I Shall Make's film is even more direct than uh, Du Hai Bin's. And then we have, uh, finally, in uh, Wang Mibo's film, Barry, we have a kind of melding and interpenetration of, of history and the, the uh, or recent quake uh, as he looks at the Tongshan earthquake of 19. 76, in which 300,000 people died, uh, roughly, I think, 80,000 died in the Sichuan quake in 2008. And his film is really an, an indictment of the way uh, human interests are buried for the sake of political interests. And it shows uh, how the lessons of Tongshan reverberate uh, even, uh, even today. And you can see Wong's quote here talking about uh, our voices as sort of uh, China's hope. Moving on, uh, even screening films internationally or submitting them to international festivals is a problem. And uh, I just mentioned Lo Ye as an example of this. Uh, he was banned from making films for five years in 06 after submitting his film Summer Palace to Cannes uh, without uh, approval uh, from SART. And his producer was also uh, banned for five years. Um, and then consider that some of China's greatest living filmmakers, like Jia Zheng He, who's generally but from, considered by film critics and filmmakers in China to be the top uh, filmmaker in China today, um, have never shown their works or their finest films uh, in China. Uh, so uh, Jia Zhangke has never shown his hometown trilogy, uh, films Pickpocket, Platform, and uh, Unknown Pleasures he have never been screened in China, at least uh, publicly. Um, And so I've talked about two strains of what I'm calling uh, voices in the gap, voices existing in the kind of craps, uh, or cracks and gaps of, of chaos in Chinese uh, society today, specifically news media and uh, film. But we see the same in other areas, in, in uh, uh, nonfiction, for example. This is uh, Yang Jisheng, uh, one of our fellows, again, uh, and editor at China's uh, Yen Huang Chunqiu, intellectual journal in China, and he's the author of this book, uh, Wu Bei, a Tombstone. And this is a, a masterful work on the great starvation in China of the 1950s and 60s, in which uh, his father uh, died. And uh, it, 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 it can't be published, of course, in mainland China because it discusses a sensitive uh, episode in the history of the party and uh, China, uh, so it's published in Hong Kong. So these voices are silenced or, or sent to the margins where they can't upset the fundamental objectives of, of this guidance I talked about earlier. Um, but again, I urge you to remember that uh, these voices, while they remind us about control, uh, also speak to the really diverse uh, atmosphere of media creation that we have uh, in China, uh, in spite of control. Um, but I want to return to my earlier discussion about uh, changing controls. As, as I said, party media entered the new century uh, facing a kind of crisis of sorts, uh, a crisis for uh, the party's agenda setting uh, capabilities. So you remember the coverage gap that I talked about between commercial and party media. Um, Hu Jintao's attempt to close this gap is something that uh, at the China Media Project we call Control 2.0. Uh, this is a whole other talk, uh, but essentially um, Hu Jintao has moved away from a, a sheer emphasis on classic uh, controls, banning content, shutting down uh, uh, reports or news media to a combination approach that involves pushing uh, messages out more actively, uh, including through uh, commercial media. And we've seen this, this term guidance has in some, some ways been replaced or augmented by a new term, uh, public opinion uh, channeling or yulun yindang. In, uh, journalists in China call this grabbing the megaphone or uh, qiang ba ba. Um, but this 
This new approach has developed over a number of years, but it was introduced in June 2008 formally. And this is Hu uh, Jintao uh, at People's Daily uh, chatting with web users to sort of demonstrate the open nature of this uh, new policy. Um, here's what it essentially means. It means using and controlling uh, the media more actively. So Hu Jintao talked about the need to use the resources, as he called them, of the commercial media uh, in China. Again, think of these vast circulations and this vast reach that these, these new commercial media have. So for breaking news, official information should hit quickly. Um, and then uh, they, they can be pushed through these commercial media, making use of their uh, vast audiences. And then traditional controls can come in afterwards, sometimes bans on, on, on coverage by commercial media. They only use Xinhua coverage, et cetera. Um, you'll all no doubt remember uh, the, the uproar over unrest in Tibet in 2008. Uh, well, Tibet was the watershed moment, really, for the, the party in, in rethinking news and propaganda. And it was seen as a failure of a media policy because the, the territory was effectively, it was closed down, and yet international media continued to report uh, the story. And then we had pictures and video, et cetera, leaking out of Tibet. Um, and as a result, the government lost control of the agenda. They yielded the agenda to uh, Western media. And that, that, at least, is the predominating thesis uh, among in China's, China's leadership today. And you can see this quote from a, a, a paper written about public opinion channeling in Utah's new, new uh, media policy term. Um, and so we've begun to see a kind of a consensus emerging in China's leadership about the need to grab the megaphone, to, to, to set the agenda internationally for, for major stories like this. So now we have two gaps that are of concern. There's the gap with uh, Western or international media on key stories like this, and also the, the gap um, between party media and commercial media at home. Again, internet and new media are another, another issue I hear that uh, I unfortunately don't have time to get into. Um, so it's not surprising that we find uh, this new Hu Jintao terminology, public opinion channeling, uh, overtaking <coughs> guidance of public opinion. I, I plotted these numbers from uh, the Wise News database, more than 100 Chinese newspapers, and it, I was surprised at how clean the change actually, uh, actually was. The intersection comes right after unrest in Tibet in 2008, and the peak, the first peak, comes right after Hu Jintao's media speech of, of June 2008. Um, so when unrest struck in Xinjiang last year, uh, we saw something very different from what we saw in Tibet in 08. Uh, China had learned its, its lesson. Um, if you try to shut down information entirely, you create a, a vacuum in, that other media, international media, occupy. Uh, so the government took a very different approach to, to uh, Lhasa. Um, was it more open? Uh, yes and uh, no. Uh, at best, it's a qualified uh, yes. Uh, the, the government, what they sort of did is to release uh, facts, information quickly. Uh, they held uh, press, regular press conferences, and they continued to drum home this message that the uh, that Xinjiang separatists had instigated uh, the violence. So uh, we also had domestic news coverage. It was, it was permitted, actually, for this story. Uh, but of course, access was restricted, and uh, the story was restricted. There was no in-depth uh, reporting, no investigation into the deeper causes of the unrest. Um, we had this kind of government spin and, uh, with all the advantages of, a, of, a, of the propaganda system. Um, we have to continue to watch this new uh, tactic, this new policy uh, that we're calling Control 2.0 to see how it plays out, it's still very, very new. Um, but I want to impress upon you this idea that uh, Control 2.0 is, is an approach to kind of closing uh, this gap uh, that I talked about earlier, or, or at least a way of kind of actively managing these cracks uh, that appear before they become a major problem uh, for the leadership. Um, but again, Control 2.0 is uh, as much a reflection of how much things have changed as a, a reflection of the determination of the leadership to maintain uh, its grip on the media. So think again of control, change, and chaos. Um, but I want to move on because we're running out of time uh, to the international dimension of uh, control uh, 2.0. Uh, Chinese leaders now feel it's important to, 
to take the battle directly to uh, Western media who set the agenda against China's interests for major sto stories like uh, Tibet. Um, so this is a quote from a 2009 article in uh, China Journalist, published by Xinhua News Agency, an important journal of media policy in China, um, and sort of a divisive view of an international uh, struggle for public opinion. That's in quotes. Um, China, it's this idea that China needs to raise its communication capacity uh, overseas. Uh, I have to move quickly or I'll just overstay my welcome here in Singapore. So one of the, the Communist Party's key answers to this challenge has been a massive investment in a sort of grand media engineering uh, project. Uh, it's called Going Out, uh, in Chinese. Uh, the idea is that Chinese media, but only state, uh, Chinese state media, like Xinhua, People's Daily, and CCTV, uh, will go out into the world and develop international media products. And this will help offset the dominance of uh, the likes of Associated Press and News Corp, etc. Um, the reported cost of this initiative so far is 6.6 .6 billion US dollars. And what, what does that buy? Uh, you can see some of the examples there. Uh, Xinhua's International TV is launching on July 1st, uh, pretty soon here. Um, will all of this work? This slide, I realize this is really full, uh, but I like including these Chinese voices that uh, suits the theme of my, you know, my talk here. You can see the quote from Li Chang Chun, who's the, the uh, Politburo Standing Committee member who handles ideology. He's essentially the top media policy official in China. Um, it tells us how important this idea is to the leadership. Um, but there's a quote at the bottom uh, by, by Mr. Cohn there, and this gets us back to the issue of soft power. And this media push is really uh, just part of what has become a much larger issue in China, and that's the development of China's soft power. Um, in his October 2000 uh, political report to the party congress, Hu Jintao mentioned uh, soft power and talked about China's need to raise uh, the nation's cultural soft power at ensuring the basic cultural rights and interests of the people are better uh, safeguarded. And then again this year we had uh, in, in Wen Jiabao's uh, government work report uh, this mention of soft power again and he talked about, quote, strengthening uh, the international influence of Chinese culture. Um, and he said the Chinese people are capable not just of creating economic miracles, but they can create new cultural splendor uh, as well. And so if you follow the conversation going on in the leadership, we constantly now see this term soft power. Uh, and I've mapped the craze here. And again, it's interesting how this maps with political events in the 17th Party Congress, and we see this massive uh, rise. Um, so China's economic influence has grown in the world, but there's, it seems the world is impervious still to China's uh, charms. It's still not attractive in ways that, that count. Uh, so this push, this response to the soft power deficit has been uh, to push more money into state campaigns like the one I just, I just mentioned. Um, and uh, this, these ideas have also reached the ears of uh, foreign dignitaries. Uh, we have, this is an editorial in the Wall Street Journal from former British Prime Minister Tony Blair, um, who visited China last, last year, and he talked about China being in the midst of a new uh, cultural revolution, and he said, quote, it's far healthier than the last one. It's hard to disagree <laughs> with a statement like that. No one would characterize the Cultural Revolution as healthy. Um, but uh, Blair, I'm afraid, has, has been misled by the sweetness of official jargon, because everywhere now in China there's talk about the, the cultural sector uh, reforms. Uh, and if, but if you look beyond these buzzwords like cultural sector reform, uh, there's not much that has a lot to do with culture. So I'll give you an example of China's soft power forum on People's Daily. And you won't hear here from, from artists or musicians or experts in the Confucian classics or filmmakers. You hear from uh, China's, China's leaders. Um, so I, I think that, that says it all. I hope, I hope it does because I have to finish here. Um, but I just want to uh, leave you with these two images. There's the, the voices in the gap that I showed you, these independent <laughs> filmmakers and journalists working within a tough system to push the envelope, do tough investigative reporting, do hard news. And, and then we have the voices that sort of represent China's push for cultural uh, soft power. And uh, of course, my suggestion is that China does have 
vast resources. China does have a lot of creativity, but the real key is to open up and release that creativity, is to release these, these voices in the gap. Um, thank you.